by drilling more wells um, and in the process we're transferring carbon to the atmosphere. Um, renewable stock, uh, uh, renewables, the stock is basically extendable indefinitely but there's a constraint on flow. Over time, long run, shrinking uh, finite stock raises the prices of extraction. Um, with renewables, uh, in principle, costs can fall over time, up to a point, uh, but you still have the biophysically constrained flow. So that's kind of the context. That's the problem area that I'm working in. Um, an overview of this talk. I'm going to start by talking about the neoclassical theory to explain why I'm not using it. Then I'm going to go on and talk about two concepts, evolutionary approaches to technological change and cost share induced technological change. Then I'll introduce a theory, that's where the, the mathematics gets fairly intense. Um, and then I come back and apply this model that I've developed to natural resources and then I'll conclude. And this is, this is um, based on a, a couple of papers. Okay. So first, the neoclassical theory. Neoclassical production function, I think we're familiar with this. Uh, output um, is equal to a, uh, a factor, total factor productivity, times uh, labor uh, to some exponent in capital. Overall, if you scale up everything, capital and labor together, uh, you get uh, constant returns to scale. But in each factor by itself, you get diminishing returns. This is thought of as a schedule of production possibilities. If you mix labor and capital in different degrees, you can get different levels of output. And firms then allocate labor and capital, maximize profits. Growth is given by this. I'm using a hat. Oh my, the super, the dot on top come, comes out as an ampersand on this PC. Very well. That's x dot over x. So x hat, that's a, a growth rate. That means a growth rate. So GDP growth is total factor productivity growth plus that coefficient A times uh, growth in labor plus 1 minus A times growth in the capital stock. And according to the theory, neoclassical theory, using marginalist calculus, factors are paid their marginal contribution to output so that parameter A has to equal omega, the wage share of total compensation. And empirically, it's found to do that, more or less, if you're careful. So some problems. First, these, these two terms, these two factors that go in there, capital and labor, they're both highly heterogeneous. Okay, the capital is any number of things. And, and labor, it's not, you don't have just a uniform worker. And Given that heterogeneity, Franklin Fisher over a series of papers showed that it's unlikely to the point of impossibility that you could actually come up with a well-defined aggregate neoclassical production function. Moreover, in the Cambridge capital controversies between Cambridge, UK and Cambridge, Massachusetts, the idea is that that aggregate K is calculated using a price because you have to combine all those, all those heterogeneous inputs using something in common, which is money, but the price is determined by the marginal contribution of aggregate capital. There's a circularity, and that can't be resolved. So that was Srafa's contribution. So why do people believe it? They believe it because it works, meaning that if you go and do a statistical fit, you get high R squared if you're careful about what you do. But there's something about those statistical tests. So I'm going to start with another set of equations. Here I'm expressing output, GDP, the value of output, as wages plus profits. OK, this is, this is from the national accounts, setting aside a bunch of other stuff, taxes and imports and exports. But wages and profits, and by definition. So this is just accounts and definitions. By definition, the unit wage is total wage bill divided by labor. By definition, the profit rate is total profits divided by the value of capital. Those are dots. Y dot equals <laughs> W dot L plus WL dot plus R dot K plus RK dot. That's just standard 
uh, calculus. Fortunately, now I'm switching to the uh, growth rates. So you get this. GDP growth is equal to this expression. And all I did was I divided the, the time derivatives by the value. So W dot divided by W, that becomes W hat. And then I multiply by it. And that factor there, WL, that's the total wage divided by the total output. So that's the wage shift. And the profits divided by total output, that's one minus the wage share, the profit share. And so we rearrange and we get this expression. Well, that's exactly the same as that growth expression I gave you before. If you identify total factor productivity growth with that expression. The regressions aren't testing the relationship. They're confirming an identity. This was shown a year after Solo's growth model. It was reestablished that by, by um, uh, forgetting the name, but it was reestablished by Sheikh. It was actually discovered uh, by Samuelson. It's been shown over and over, and it is not taken into account. Phelps Brown, that's right, that was first, first shown. And Felipe and McCombie, McCombie have been uh, working on this uh, quite a lot. So I'm not interested in the neoclassical production function. Not going to use it because it, it has no theoretical basis and the statistical tests aren't actually testing for it. So there's no justification for using it. And the, the neoclassical theory of technological change is also problematic for a couple of reasons. First, because it's based on that neoclassical production function. And second, because it requires a level of knowledge, general knowledge, about the technological frontier that I'm not entirely comfortable with. And I like evolutionary theory better, in which firms know their own technology. They have some knowledge of what their rivals are doing. They're continually trying to raise profits in the short run by looking for small improvements, little innovations that will cut costs at given prices and wages. But it doesn't last. They have a temporary monopoly position, but it's really temporary for most technologies, since most of those improvements aren't actually uh, uh, necessarily protected, and they're kind of easy to copy without, without violating um, patent, uh, patents. So, as the technologies are adopted or imitated by rivals, um, you have these, the, these effects. Workers might demand a share in the gains. Less possible now than in the past, but can happen. Some firms lower their prices, eroding the excess profits. And so you get an adjustment, and then the firms start all over again. So I'll show this in diagram form. You innovate to save on costs. Those diffuse to other firms, those innovations. Competitive pressures lead to changes in prices and wages. And you're back where you started on the technological treadmill. And this brings me to the topic of cost share induced technological change. So, some notation. I'm going to use throughout productivity in general. I'm going to use the new for productivity uh, as, as output divided by the quantity of some input. And the cost share is the price of that multiplied by the quantity divided by the value of output. Um, I'm doing everything in real terms. So here, real means relative to the price level of GDP. So, um, so uh, that's why I, I just have a price on the numerator. Uh, it's divided by the price and the denominator, and that, that gives me my real price. Um, and note that the cost share is just the real price divided by the productivity. Special cases, I'll use kappa uh, for capital productivity and pi for the profit share, lambda for labor productivity and omega for the wage share, and for natural resources, a nu for the productivity and rho for the, for the cost share. Okay, here is the statement of cost share induced technological change. This is the idea. When the cost share for an input goes up, firms make a stronger effort to improve, to reduce their use of that particular input. By reducing use, that means that they're improving their productivity. And again, I emphasize that there's a two-step process. First, there's innovation at constant wages and prices. They're trying to get a temporary monopoly. 
then computation changes the cost shares. Productivity growth is, of course, limited by technological potential. This idea has a long history. Uh, Ricardo discussed it back in, the, uh, uh, back in the early 19th century. Marx, um, slightly later than Ricardo, um, and he pointed out this, this issue of um, competition changing the situation. Hicks uh, was really explicit about it, and a lot of people, uh, both neoclassical and, and, uh, and uh, heterodox, uh, base kind of start from Hicks, and then all these other people, Caldor, Kennedy, Samuelson, et cetera, et cetera. And he... Isn't this also Schumpeterian? It's uh, the evolutionary is Schumpeterian. Cost share induced technological change is more these guys. Um, and you end up with an equilibrium seeking dynamic. Okay, so you start with cost share induced technological change. The cost share goes up and the growth rate of the productivity goes up. You make more of an effort. If, if the productivity goes up, if you accelerate that, you're using less of something, and other things being equal, that tends to reduce uh, the, the cost of that. There's less demand, so other things equal, you reduce that. And so what you get is, in this dynamic, a tendency, since you've got a positive influence and a negative influence, you look at that causal loop diagram, you get overall a negative feedback loop. And so you tend towards constant cost shares and productivity growth rates as a stable, as the, the, the equilibrium position in this system. And that's actually what we tend to observe. It's not the, the neoclassical price mechanism for equilibration. So you come to an equilibrium, but it's not that price. There is, though, a center of gravitation, which is interesting for, from a classical perspective. And it's not just for resources. It works for any input. The values of those uh, equilibrium values depend on technological uh, potential. So that's more physically based. And on wage and price setting behavior. And that's more socially and institutionally based. So it's all in there. And when you've got more than two inputs, you can see some transient perverse behavior where you, you actually get, uh, get these behaviors flipped around. This first one, uh, rising cost share, but a, but a falling productivity growth rate. It's theoretically possible. It can be seen, but it's transient because um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it can't persist for economic reasons. All right. So now I want to say a word about decoupling. So resource cost share. It's a resource cost divided by the resource times the resource divided by GDP is, as I showed before, the price divided by the productivity. OK? And at equilibrium, this is a constant. Therefore, if these are growing or shrinking, they're doing it at the same rate because that ratio has to stay the same. So, absolute decoupling means that the productivity growth rate exceeds the GDP growth rate. That's what decoupling means, literally. And from this, we therefore conclude that for absolute decoupling to occur, the price has to grow faster than GDP. But you don't expect that with abundant resources. So I offer this as an example, as an explanation for why we have not seen absolute decoupling in the past. It can happen with a resource task in which you're steadily raising the price, and it can happen with constrained resources. OK, now I'm going to get into some theory. Um, this will become mathematically intensive, but, but I do want to show it because personally I like to see what's behind the stuff I'm putting forward, so I'm going to do that now. 
I'm going to start with the PCO's viability criterion. So the idea here is that if a firm is going to adopt an innovation, that innovation has to raise the profit rate. So that thing about the temporary monopoly, if, if a potential innovation coming from the lab, no matter how excited the R&D department is about what they've done, if it's not actually going to give a temporary monopoly, they'll say no and won't implement it. Sticking just with capital and labor for now. So we've got the profit rate is profits divided by capital. Uh, divide each of those by um, GDP and you get uh, the profit rate times capital productivity. Uh, the capital productivity, if it's only wages and capital, is uh, one minus the wage share. And the wage share is the wage over labor productivity. Okay, so this all came from what I showed before. So starting with R is equal to, you know, this last expression that we got. Look at growth rates. Growth rate in R is growth rate in kappa plus, and here you're holding the wage fixed, so just looking at lambda, and you end up with this. This ratio is omega. One minus omega is pi, so you end up with this. That expression. What was lambda again? Lambda is labor productivity. So, so if you require that the innovation raise the profit rate, then this equals zero, multiply through by pi, and you get this right here. That's Okishio's viability theorem. Now there was a neat little paper by a couple of uh, economists, Dumenil and Levy, um, and, and they were asking, why is there a bias in technological, uh, uh, technological in, uh, improvements? Why is labor productivity rising while capital productivity tends not to rise? So labor productivity over time tends to rise. Marx said capital productivity would have to fall but in fact, what was observed um, by the 20th century was that it tended to be kind of constant, and it actually, with more recent data than either of them had, it tends to fluctuate, but with no trend. That's, that's kind of what we see. So why do you have that bias? And they started with this idea that, okay, it's an evolutionary theory. Suppose you're, you, you set the R&D department out and they just find whatever they can. And there's some probability of finding it. And most often they fail completely. They find something that reduces both capital and labor productivity. Because these are the growth rates and that's the intercept. But... So this is, and this is, uh, I've drawn it so that it's uh, symmetric around the axis, so it's completely unbiased. But we've got this Okishio viability line that R has to increase. So they can only be looking up in this part, up here. So you get biased technological change. Here you've actually got a negative uh, growth rate for capital productivity, a la Marx and a positive one for labor. Okay, pretty cool. Um, and if you change this line by changing the profit rate, uh, profit share, um, and therefore the wage share, say you increase it from 0.3 to 0.4, it changes Okishio's viability line. And therefore, it changes the, the growth rate in productivity. So it all comes from this probability of, of discovery plus Okishio's viability line. And what you find is that if you increase the wage share, it increases the growth rate in labor productivity. If you increase the profit share, it increases the growth rate in capital productivity. This was really lovely. This is a really nice thing. So there are some strong benefits from the paper by Dumenil and Levy. Um, and 
The micro story is reasonable. It's about the firm. What does the firm do? They want to get these temporary profits at constant profit uh, prices and wages. Um, but then, uh, and through a random and incremental search, just looking in the neighborhood of what they're already doing, and then competition um, brings the brings the um, uh, prices and wages to new levels that, that affects the, the cost share. A bias arises naturally from the Oficio Viability Theorem, and as has been shown by others, including Julius, it provides a cost share induced theory of technological change that you can use in a bunch of different models. Julius used um, a, a classical and a post Keynesian and a Marxian uh, model. But there are some limitations. That symmetric, circularly symmetric probability for discovery with, with labor and capital only is, is a constraint. Also, despite those limitations, as Julius pointed out, he said, and you don't give me any, any constraints on the functional form of these relationships. <clears throat> Um, and then something I'm not going to discuss here, but that I do resolve is, is how to reconcile with, um, with uh, the caldor verdorn law, which is a quite well-established empirical regularity. Um, and so what I'm going to show now is how I dealt with these, except for this fourth one. So first, Okishio's viability theorem, it extends very readily to any number of inputs. Um, and so you impose this and you get, uh, you know, I had, I had pi times kappa hat plus omega times lambda hat. That generalizes to cost shares times uh, productivity growth rates are greater than zero, where I've added this in. So I've, I've done this. They limited to labor and capital inputs. I've generalized. Okay. Now, average productivity change. That's in that bit of the circle. So for Dumini Le Levy, it was that bit of the circle that was above the Opicio viability line up here. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I've got that growth rate. I've got the probability distribution, which is this. And I'm imposing the Okishio viability criterion using a step function. It's equal to 1 if sigma dot nu hat is positive. It's equal to 0 otherwise. So H for heaviside. That's the heaviside step function. And the only place where the cost share shows up is in this step function. It's Okishio's viability criterion. So I take the derivative. I'm taking the derivative of the step function. The derivative of the step function is a delta, delta function. So I end up with that. I, I take this derivative, I'm calling that a matrix M, and I get this expression right now. So, um, so I've now generalized beyond that, that symmetric circular probability distribution. And M turns out to be the interesting quantity. So some features of the matrix. First, this is the expression I just got. Swap those indices, and it looks exactly the same. So it's symmetric. It's positive. Multiply this by xj, uh, by xj, multiply that by xi, and sum. Those are exactly the same expression. So it's squared. That's positive. Uh, that's positive or, or non-negative. Non so is that. So everything's non-negative. And it's semi-definite. That's really irritating that it didn't work right there. Those are, I don't, I don't even know what those are. But <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh, I know what that is. That's showing that um, this expression right here, that's actually a curly brace. My goodness. That's um, this expression times the delta function. It's zero. The delta function is zero unless its argument is zero. So if you multiply by its argument, it's zero everywhere. So, so in contrast to Julius's critique, I have place constraints on the cost share productivity change relationship. All right. 
I have, according to my clock, three minutes. Okay. So I'm going to introduce natural resources. So, and I'm going to introduce a toy model. So first of all, I introduce this right here. Now, why is this nice? Because it's a viable in matrix. Okay. I, if I, if I were to take those derivatives, I would find that this is uh, symmetric and positive semi-definite in the right way. And this is not enough because this is about the innovation step. I also need price and wage setting. So I'm going to say uh, I'm going to use target return pricing in which firms say that they want a particular <coughs> rate of return. So if COPPA changes, if their capital productivity changes, if it goes down like Mark said, then they bump up their profit share to make sure they maintain their profit rate. This is something that more or less happened from the 80s onward. Before that, it was a different situation. I'm going to set an exogenous real resource price. Now, in the paper, I don't do that. I, I put in some assumptions about price response to demand and some other factors. But here I'm going to keep it simple. And labor is a residual. It's complicated looking. Who cares? Because at this point, I've got rho, I've got pi, I've got A, I calculate it. Fine. So I set some values for the parameters. I say, as has historically been the case over a long time, uh, up, aside, up through up through the late 90s, uh, aside from the oil crisis, which could have been said to be mainly political, price, the real price barely budged. So I'm going to say the price, real price was flat. And with these assumptions, I get, I get some reasonable things. I've got labor productivity growing at around 2% a year, constant capital productivity according to Caldor's law. Um, I therefore find that this is zero. And I've got some reasonable looking cost shares. Now I'm going to assume that the price starts rising as it has been doing in, since, the 2000, since 2000, more or less. Labor productivity goes down. Profit and resource share go up. Um, resource productivity increases. Uh, growth increases. And, and labor productivity growth <laughs> slows. Um, so how does it do? I have two seconds. So I'm going to look at these two periods where energy was increasing. Uh, I'm sorry, where the oil price was increasing. And let's take a look. With the first one, bam, the uh, shares of gross domestic income. So omega fell once that happened. Um, it kept falling because why not? I mean, once it's falling, you've got some political momentum. Great, I can keep that falling. Um, but it fell more steeply when the prices rose again. Um, labor productivity growth slowed abruptly, and then it slowed again here, and continued to slow. So more stuff is going on. It's not the only dynamic. In that first period, um, exergy intensities started dropping much faster than they had in the past, um, and it's much less visible down here. Uh, again. You kick in some changes, but once this had ended, it wasn't falling as fast. So that seems kind of nice to me. Um, rather than a neoclassical production function, from a post-Keynesian perspective, I think in terms of production regimes where, with a um, Leontief uh, production function, where I might be uh, limited in a number of different ways. Um, and you can, you can say, okay, a, a developing economy with a dual structure, uh, you have one set of constraints, a mature econ a stock limited economy like we got now, you got another one. And what we're heading to is a mature flow limited economy, which is a different beast altogether. But I would argue that this theoretical framework can translate to that. So conclusions, characteristics of fossil resources given us high labor productivity, what you go to the resource point of view, resource, I, I see you garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's consistent with this theory. Dwindling fossil resources and switch to flow limited resources could give us low labor productivity and wage growth 
high resource productivity and resource price growth and high profit share, GDP growth constrained by the flow of renewables. We can live on renewables indefinitely into the future, potentially with a high level of technological sophistication, but the economy would look quite different, and these are the reasons why I would say thank you. Thank you.